Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy R.N. is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy R.N. Welcome to Dr. Nancy R.N. Healthy world, healthy nation, healthy you. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse. And this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. And our show today is the ins another installment in the area of chronobiology. And today our title of our show is The Graveyard Shift, How to Work Shift Successfully Before You Are Six Feet Under. Or another way of si saying this is the science of surviving shift work. And this whole area of chronobiology is an area that has to do with sleep rhythms. And we have an expert with us today that's going to describe sleep rhythms to us, how this is affected by night shift work, and real tips on what you can do if you are a night shift worker. So I'd like to welcome back Dr. Donald McEachran. And Dr. Dr. McEachran is a teaching professor in the School of Biomedical Engineering, Science, and Health Systems at Drexel University. He is a PhD and has had a lot of publications in this area and is a true expert. In fact, he has this book, on chronobioengineering. Now this may sound like a big mouthful for any of you that haven't really heard about this before, but this is a really fascinating area and I've been learning from Don as well because our rhythms in our body are very sensitive to things that we can take charge of, that we can really take some of the tips and we can change our environment, we can change our patterns, and we can become more healthy as a result of it. So this area of shift work is really important because there are so many people that are affected. Airline pilots, nurses, doctors, uh, engineers of, of the type that Don uh, is, they, they even have shift work issues because they're doing a lot of the research around the clock. We have policemen, firemen. Uh, being the daughter of a fireman, I can tell you our whole mm -hmm. household revolved around my father's shift work. So I'm very acquainted with it from that perspective as well. So Don, thank you so much for being with us again today. And I think that part of our mission here is really to talk about the science of shift work so that people that are on shift work really have a better understanding of their body's response to their work demands. So can you really start us off on what does happen with sleep patterns and awake patterns and especially how that's impacted by shift work? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I myself have worked shift uh, in a plastics factory as well as uh, doing my research, so I am somewhat acquainted uh, with some of the, the results of engaging in shift work. And, and the, the idea behind this, again, is that we have a biological clock within our brain which keeps timing uh, our various activities. It is synchronized to the light-dark cycle so that the timing within our body, the internal timing, matches the external environment. And so the, the typical pattern for a human being is that we wake up in the morning, we are active during the day, and we sleep at night. This may seem trivial, but this is a very important set of physiological and behavioral processes. When you engage in shift work, of course, you're working off sync with this evolved pattern. So you're attempting to be active, say, uh, in swing shift in the afternoon into the evening. That may not be so bad, but night shift, you're actually trying to almost become nocturnal. You're turning from a human into a bat. You're trying <laughs> to be active at night and then sleep during the day. This is not a natural pattern uh, for the human body. And it becomes a, a problem because what, what can happen is that as you go through shifts, if you're not stable uh, and only working on one shift, you're going from one shift to another shift to another shift, which is often the case uh, with shift workers, that it's a little bit like traveling across time zones. Uh, I'm sure most of you have uh, traveled to the West Coast or traveled to Europe, and you understand that when you arrive there, you seem a little off balance. You're not as, as happy, you're not as functional, you may be tired, fatigued. Uh, oftentimes um, your food doesn't taste quite right and sometimes when you eat you get an upset stomach. This is all called a jet lag in, in the vernacular. 
And so when you travel across time zones, you're a little bit off sync from the external environment, right. and it takes time to resync uh, your body to that external environment. And while you're trying to resynchronize, uh, your body ends up with a number of, of issues that usually are fairly mild, but are annoying. Right. So basically what I hear you saying is that uh, for those of us who have been on shift work at different times of our lives, we're sort of taking a, a trip every day in terms oh, of perfect. the biology. Absolutely perfect. So what you're trying to do is you're, you're taking these trips and remember when you did that trip across several time zones, it took a few days before things stabilized out and you felt normal. And you did certain things. If you knew what was going on, you would wake up uh, at the time in the morning uh, in your destination, you get out in the sun, you end up resynchronizing to this new environment fairly quickly. But as you point out, if you're engaging in shift work where you're going from one shift to another, you're essentially traveling across not just one or two time zones, but six, eight time zones equivalent. And then you're only giving yourself a small period of time to resynchronize. And if you do this fast enough, you never resynchronize. So in fact, you are getting jet lag and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Right, and how do people experience that? Are there various um, uh, outcomes of that? People experience it differently? What are some of the general uh, takeaways from what ha is happening in your body to what you experience as the person? Well, first off, it should be realized that there are vast individual differences in people's tolerance to shift work. Some people, when they try shift work, simply can't do it. Uh, they feel so bad initially um, that they can't continue. Mm -hmm. Then there are people who seem to be able to tolerate it fairly well, that they don't suffer uh, significant abnormalities at least uh, for a, a large portion of the time they're doing it. But if you were to list some of the things that are common to shift workers, they'd be gastrointestinal complaints, um, problems uh, like ulcers, uh, cardiovascular issues, there's an increased risk for myocardial infarction or, or heart attack. Uh, you have sleep disorders. Oftentimes you end up with uh, sleep deprivation. You don't sleep as well when you're working on a, on a shift. Uh, so you don't get enough sleep. And that of course tends to make other things worse because you need to have a certain amount of sleep to function normally. Um, recently, and this is fairly recent and it's not uh, well established, but it's becoming well established. It looks as if uh, shift work also may increase the incidence of certain types of cancers. Um, another problem is psychiatric uh, complaints. I know of one study where the number of psychiatric complaints on night shift was 1500 percent higher than the, the same number of complaints on the normal day shift. So these are situations that result from a combination of rhythm disorder, that is internal desynchronization, your rhythm's not matching your environment, and sleep deprivation. Right, so I think that part of uh, what we're hearing is that you can have some pretty ominous outcomes um, if your sleep is that disrupted. But the purpose of this program is really to acknowledge that you could be at risk, but also to give you tips on how you can really dampen down the effects of this and really pay attention to your own body. So it sounds like from what you're telling us, the most important thing is that despite working other shifts or the night shift, getting sleep is really critical. Getting enough sleep is certainly key. Uh, when I was working shift, uh, night shift, one of the problems was that my apartment was not really uh, dark when I was trying to sleep. So there's light coming through the, the curtains. Uh, there were children playing outside. Um, the rest of the world was awake while I was trying to sleep. So one thing you can do uh, to help, and I think most shift workers uh, probably do this already, but just to, to emphasize this, is you want to try and get at least seven hours of sleep. And so you want to make sure that the place that you do sleep is dark, it's as quiet as possible, um, that you plan on this, that you make certain that, that as soon as you get, especially with night shift, the sooner you get to sleep after you get off night shift, the more likely you are to get the proper amount of sleep and the right restful sleep. Um, again, if there are lights in the room, um, try and make them red lights. They, that has less effect on your timing system than having white light. 
but it's really critical to plan uh, as, as hard as possible to get at least seven hours of sleep. Right. I think that's really important because it would be so easy to be distracted. I mean, when people, I know I can just speak from the, the nursing background that I have, when nurses go home, they've got often many other obligations. They're trying to get, they're trying to trade off and get their, their children to school, or their children are coming home before they've had seven hours of sleep. There's always disruptions, um, but it sounds like those disruptions come at a real cost uh, because the bottom line is that our whole society really depends on shift workers. We wouldn't be able to run hospitals or fire departments or police departments or just go through a whole list of pilots. We wouldn't be able to have flights at night if it wasn't for people that were willing to work the night shift. Plus, there are a lot of compensation issues that are tied to night shifts. Often people are making considerably more uh, money, so it's a real incentive to work the night shift. But it sounds like these things come where there are premiums uh, attached to night shift. They would come at a cost if you, didn't, if you don't take care of yourself. Well, also, uh, there are certain uh, sort of screening uh, factors that you need to think about when considering going on night shift. Um, the compensation may be good, but there is indeed a cost, and you need to think about that cost in comparison to the compensation. So, for example, I mentioned that shift work increases your risk for cardiovascular disorder. If you have um, a, a uh, cardiovascular issue to begin with, or if you have a, a family history, you might want to reconsider this. You might not want to uh, take that risk but at least you should be aware of it. Um, if you have acid reflux disorder, as I do, for example, um, that would be a, a, a red flag for going on shift work because shift work has a tendency uh, to generate these uh, gastrointestinal issues. Matter of fact, I, I can give you a quick example, a little image here that I can show you as to why this might work. So yes. for example- Walk us through that, Don. If you look at this image, what you will see is there, there are two wave forms, two patterns. One in red that indicates the amount of acid being secreted within the stomach, and one in blue, which is the amount of mucus, which is like a, an antacid. Think of it as a biological tums there. Your body normally has these two rhythms in phase. That is, when you have the maximum amount of acid secreted, you have the maximum amount of protection secreted. And so this keeps your stomach from developing an ulcer. Right, now just to, just to translate this a step further, the mucus, which would be the blue uh, line that Don just described to us, is really what coats your stomach. Uh, and that is the protection, as he said, because you do need acid, the, the red uh, line, because you use the acid to break down the foods and to, to transport the nutrients of the food uh, through your bloodstream eventually. Etc. So that is a really good point that these things have to be in sync. Otherwise, if you have too much acid, you could have an ulcer because it's like breaking through that lining of the stomach. If you had too much mucus, that wouldn't be good either because right. then you wouldn't be uh, absorbing the nutrients that the acids are breaking Absolutely down. Absolutely correct. So, so I think that it's really good. It's always good to see something in sync like that. But then let's go to the next line. What's happening there? Well, here where it says out of phase. Okay. We've just taken the two waveforms and shifted them in time. So now what you see is, and it's the same levels, so we're not creating any more acid or any more mucus, um, which would be you know, harmful. Right. We're creating the appropriate amount of acid and mucus, but now they're just at different times. And because they're at different times, the acid is now being secreted and peaking where the mucus is not available and it's like you have no protection or minimal protection. And so when you secrete the acid, it now can attack the cells of the stomach because you don't have that coating there. And all you've done, you haven't changed the amount, all you've done is changed the timing. And so when you have that thing I called internal desynchronization, it's when these sorts of clocks are off sync from each other and suddenly you're secreting mucus when you don't really need it, but not secreting it when you really do. Right. So, I mean, in terms of this example, it's, it's very uh, interesting in that it's simple. It's something that I think most of us can understand. But that second, uh, where it is out of sync, 
where it is uh, happening at different time intervals. Is that the kind of thing that people on the night shift experience? Yes, yes. So basically, the, the question is whether you're really synchronized to your new schedule or not. And uh, think of it as uh, if you're traveling to Singapore, um, as I did recently, you get a rather significant amount of jet lag, but after a few days, you become adjusted to Singapore and you're on Singapore time. Right. So, so everything is back in phase. Right. So so when you first landed in Singapore, you were the bottom where everything was sort of haywire. Right. But then your body does with, with the proper sleep and attention like you're, you're uh, teaching us about to really making sure that you get a good quality of sleep and it's of a long enough duration, then your body does have the way of, of an ability to sort of snap back. Right. And so what happens with the, the, the shift situation is that if you are rapidly shifting, so for example, you're, you're doing four days on one shift and another four days and another four days, it's like, again, as you pointed out, traveling across time zones repeatedly. You are end up in the bottom graph all the time. Right. And then that's, uh, after, a long, after time, that can accumulate and eventually cause damage. But the alternative is if you stay on a particular shift, and you do it long enough, like going to Singapore, you begin to synchronize to that new shift. It's a little easier to do this when you travel to Singapore because, of course, the external environment is what you are synchronizing to. Right. You are in Singapore, so adjusting the Singapore time is fairly easy. The problem if you're doing night shift in Philadelphia is that, unfortunately, Philadelphia is not Singapore, and Philadelphia's light-dark cycle remains out of sync with your night shift schedule. And so you need to take some steps to help yourself stay synchronized to that night shift. And a couple of things you can do. Now let's talk about those because I think that they're the sort of environmental tips and personal behavior tips that people really need in order to stay in sync. I mean, that's the chronobiology of this, which is the science of rhythms. Right. So I think what we're getting out of this is that there are all these sort of invisible rhythms going on in your body, and your body is phenomenal in being able to, to adjust to, to a certain degree, but it needs help. Right. It needs help. So we really have to help our bodies. So, so walk us through some of those aids. What would help us? Well, again, you really want to get that seven hours of sleep. So you want to have a sleep environment when you get home or wherever it is you're sleeping that is key to allow you to sleep, that it's dark, that it's quiet, and that you can be undisturbed as much as possible. Right. The other point is because you're still, uh, say we're talking Philadelphia, so you're still in Philadelphia time, if you are doing night shift and you walk out of your job and you get hit with the rising sun, that information will be conveyed to your biological clock and it will snap you right back into a day active um, cycle. So as you try and adjust to night shift, being exposed to early morning sun pushes you back toward a day shift and that would um, cause you to become internally desynchronized. Well, there's a fairly simple way to handle that and that is fairly dark sunglasses, things that block out uh, a lot of the sort of blue-green light that comes out of the sun, that will help. Um, it's not absolute, but it certainly would help. Um, minimizing your exposure to, to sunlight um, while you're trying, you know, during the, the day, that'll help. The other thing you can do, and this it depends on your cooperation from your employer, is if you can get a break room or a room where you can have bright light that you can go in and as you come on to your shift, um, say night shift, you can go into this room, be exposed with bright um, white light. That will help you to synchronize to your night shift. Right. Well, let's let's sort of uh, walk through those again because that is intriguing. Uh, I think that getting very dark sunglasses. Uh, it's polarized is fine, but Don told me that polarization of your sunglasses are really not going to make a difference. This is a different phenomena of really dampening down the light rays, period. So you have to look for good sunglasses that are dark enough that you still can see, but as dark as you can possibly tolerate. So I think you should really go shopping for those um, in a really purposeful way. And I have to be honest, I haven't seen too many nurses leaving the hospitals with their, their dark glasses on. So, I mean, this is something that not the average person, I think, is really doing. 
They're so probably it, not aware of it. They're not aware of it. So I mean, this is really an awareness factor. And I think that it's so simple. Put those dark glasses on as you're you know, walking out the door before you get to your car so you're not getting this blast of light that's going to make it even harder for you to go into that sleep mode. Because what you're saying is you're really retraining your body to have a different cycle. And it's really critical because if you don't train your body, it's always out of sync and it's always trying to compensate, but it never quite gets there in terms of this chronobiological rhythm, which is really the underlying science of what we're talking about. I think the second thing that you talked about in terms of having a break room, or as Don pointed out to me, if you're working in a factory, it's a lot easier to do this because in a hospital, we spend a lot of time trying to decrease noise in the hallways, which is a very big problem in mm -hmm. hospitals. Um, and also we decrease the light so that we can have our patients sleep. They, we want them on their normal rhythms. Right. But for the staff who are out of sync with their normal rhythms, that is not good because it's making you sleepy at a time when you're supposed to be productive and mm -hmm. working. So Don's remedy for that is that we really start to design break rooms. Almost every inpatient clinical unit and, and many outpatient units will have a break room for mm -hmm. staff, you know, where you have your lunch or your coffee break, because it's often very hard to get off of these units. They're very busy. So if they were be designed with these bright blue green lights, which are either blue and green, as he pointed out, you can actually go out and buy blue and green lights because they operate on a portion of the brain that really, again, helps you to stay awake at night. Or these new LED lights, if you get the super bright ones, they have a lot of the blue-green uh, light inside of them. So you're going to get the same, almost same effect as, as having an actual blue or a green light. Again, a simple tip but that could be a place where people go to write their notes or they go to for a cup of coffee right. or they're going to talk about a patient situation. They are really getting something back for their own physiology by having that. But I don't think, again, most of us know that that's, that's uh, something that we could do. So I think very few places have really done that. But that's a wonderful tip. Right. And, and we've done research, various uh, my colleagues and I, uh, looking at light. Uh, and so... Um, there have been studies which have shown that if you increase light at certain times uh, of the night during things like night shift, you actually reduce accidents as well as uh, improve performance. So it's not just that you suffer when you are, are desynchronized. You are less capable when you're desynchronized. And so if you're both sleep deprived right. and desynchronized, you're prone to accident and errors in judgment. Um, recently there was a study or there was a review published that seemed to indicate, which is really a very interesting result, that sleep deprivation of what we call rapid eye movement sleep, that sometimes people will call inaccurately dream sleep, close enough. Right. Or Re REM, REM sleep. sleep. REM sleep. All right. So as you decrease your REM sleep, and this is what often happens with shift work when you have this sleep deprivation. Memories associated with negative emotions seem to be resistant to being lost. So those memories are retained. But memories associated with positive emotion, those are interfered with by losing REM sleep. So you have this emotional balance, and as you get sleep deprived, it shifts in a negative direction. Right. So uh, now you have this, this, you're not feeling well, you're fatigued, emotionally you're a bit raw and you're making medical decisions or you're a truck driver driving down the road or you're an airline pilot making uh, life or death decisions this is an issue right. it's an issue beyond your own health it's an issue for public health as well right I think that is a really important point Don because it's another symptom that you can pay attention to and you can also ask those that you work with or your family members to point this out to you if you don't notice it. So if you become grouchy and grumpy, this may not be like a personality problem. I mean, it could be a personality issue, but it may be your rhythms are out of sync. So it's really a cardinal sign that you are out of balance and that it is really very critically important both for your efficiency and effectiveness on your job and the safety of the others that you're caring for, as well as for your own safety. 
And it's not a really bad idea to really ask people to give you that prompt because sometimes you're just thinking, I have a lot on my mind, I've got this, I've got that. And you're sort of rushing through, you're not getting your proper rest and you won't know it's really a problem until it's too late, like there's been an accident or a car accident or whatever. And there have been studies that have really studied this. So we know that uh, accidents, misjudgments are associated with lack of sleep. So this sleep and getting all of your biological rhythms in place is really a big part of your job. And I think what I'm hearing is that we just have to be willing as night workers or those of us who are hiring people uh, that are night workers to be really sensitive to this, yeah. this health issue because it's a combination of what we as employers can do to really help design environments that are really conducive to our night work staff and also we can uh, help people take some responsibility of this for themselves where, it's, where it makes sense for them to take their own personal responsibility. So it's a team. It, it has to work together. Would you agree? Oh yes. Uh, I think that, that when you're thinking uh, healthcare reform, this is one issue that, that makes sense in uh, that if you provide an environment that reduces uh, the risk, reduces the cost of shift work. I mean, you certainly do, don't want to pretend that you can get rid of shift work. Shift work right. is, is necessary, it's important for our society. It's something essential right. that people do. But if you are screening people properly, if you are sort of monitoring them, both uh, the individuals themselves, their families, the, right. the businesses, um, you can reduce the cost uh, and retain the benefit. Right. So, can't reduce the cost to zero, but you can certainly right. uh, reduce right. it significantly, I think. Right. Well, I would like to take this opportunity, Don, to dedicate this show and his amazing expertise as a neurobiologist in the field of chronobiology to really help us understand what it's like to be a shift worker. So I'd like to dedicate this show to all of you sure. out there and to everyone that you know is a shift worker because I think that what we've done today is that we've gone through in terms of our three key points, how sleep rhythms are impacted and how all of your biological rhythms are impacted by shift work. We've talked about some of the things that you can do about preserving your sleep patterns because that is really very, very critical to this whole equation. And third, we've gone through some very basic, low-cost tips of things that you can do and perhaps employers can adopt in order to create, with minimal impact as far as cost and, and redesign, but with powerful impact for the health and wellness of those who are working in these environments to really have the environment that's most conducive to your, your shift of your body and your rhythms. Often when we talk about it takes a team in healthcare to really make the difference as we are learning so much more and know how we can apply new knowledge, the science of how to get a good night's sleep, the science of how to preserve the health and wellness of shift workers is something that we've discussed today. And I want to thank Dr. Donald McEachran for being our, our guest today and really educating us about this new field of study. I have learned a tremendous amount and I hope that my colleagues in healthcare and those of you that are in shift work in various walks of life will be able to adopt some of these and really help us for our own safety and for the safety and welfare of the others that we treat and care for. I hope you've learned something today and that you will be able to use this with yourself and your friends, your family, etc. I hope that you will remember that with health, all things are possible. Thank you very much for joining us and have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. Or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.